again. Welcome to Freedom. It's so good to see you here today. To those of you who are joining online, uh, thank you so much for tuning in. We love that you take part uh, in what's happening at Freedom every week by doing that. Uh, I, I have already been, been welcomed as a guest this morning, uh, so uh, I, I acknowledge we have been out for a spell, but it is so good to be back with you, Jackie, and I appreciate the opportunity we've had the past couple of weeks to go away and to recharge, and it has had that effect. It has been such a good time away. We've loved every minute of the time that we've been away, but I, I've got to say that uh, the overwhelming thing that uh, I just kept feeling and thinking as we were worshiping together is reflecting on the last two and a half weeks, and, and don't misunderstand, I'm very grateful for everything that we got to experience and see, and uh, everything was as good as we had hoped for and better, but I was just thinking as we were worshiping together, we've been in some incredible places the last two and a half weeks. We've been in the Sistine Chapel, we've been in St. Peter's Basilica, we've been in these wonderful Greek Orthodox churches. We've been to beautiful locations, Greek islands all over Rome and Italy and all these different places and seeing beautiful things. And as good as those things were, nothing that we experienced in the last two and a half weeks matches what the last 30 minutes have done in my heart to just be with, together with you, with our faith family, worshiping the Lord. It's just such a great reminder to me that as wonderful as things are to see out in the world, what a tragic mistake it is that people make when they say, well, you know, I don't really get into that organized religion thing. My, my place where I worship is on the golf course or it's out on the bay fishing or whatever. Don't get me wrong. You can experience Christ in all of those places. But nothing for, for my money matches the joy and the impact of being with the people of God, focused completely on the goodness of God. And, celebrating him so it's a joy to be back with you and to do that together thank you to tony and our team for leading us well i'm going to invite you to open your bibles you're going to need them today we're going to be in john chapter 14 but it's going to be a few minutes before we go there but i'm going to ask you to go ahead and turn there and uh, just just hold your finger there i heard a wise person some time back make a statement that's very true he said this that there are a few things in your life that will have greater impact on how you live your life than what you understand the narrative to be that your life is a part of. Now, I realize that's kind of a complicated statement, so I'm going to back up and, and say it again. That few things have greater impact on the way that you live your life, more so than what you believe to be the narrative that your life is a part of. Do you get what the statement means? Like there's this bigger story that's taking place and your life is a part of a bigger story and what you understand the bigger story to be has a huge impact on how you live your life. Now there are a lot of different people who try and define what the bigger story is and by the way that's part of the reason that we enjoy books and movies as much as we do is it gives us an opportunity to look at stories and to insert ourselves into those stories and to see what it would be like if we were a part of that big story. But the truth of the matter is there is a bigger story that's being told and it's not a work of fiction. It is the great narrative of all of history. It is God's epic story that he's telling and just like most of the great stories that have ever been written or told in literature, it's a three-act play. Those of you who studied literature in high school and in college, you remember that most of the great works of literature came in three acts. There's an opening act where we get introduced to the characters and to the problem that creates the drama, and act two is the unfolding of that drama, and act three is, is the climax and the conflict and the conclusion of that whole matter. It's, it's a three-act deal. And, and by the way, you know, that, that still gets played out. We don't think in terms of dramas today. We think in terms of movies, don't we? We don't go to a lot of plays. Well, we, we go to a lot of plays. We still love live stuff. But most of us think in terms of movies. And so we think of movies with sequels. But regardless, you know, whether you're thinking The Godfather 1, 2, and 3 or, or the great plays of, of Shakespeare, they are three-act stories. And God's great unfolding story is a three-act drama. Now... The first act, I would contend, begins in Genesis 1 and concludes at the end of the Gospels. We can agree pretty readily on what act one of God's great narrative is all about. We are introduced to the characters. 
One God who's always three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is completely good, all-powerful, all-wise, all-knowing. That's the good. On the bad, we're introduced to the embodiment of evil, Satan and all these hosts of fallen angels who have followed him. And between these two warring parties is all of creation, the world as we know it, and all of humanity, the crowning work of creation, made in the image of God, made to be the family of God, the perfect and crowning work of creation. And then we're introduced to the real drama of this story that these people made in the image of God, made for God, made for the family of God, we discover that evil enters into the picture and in two very different but equally destructive ways, evil has just torn us apart. Evil from without, personified evil. Satan has entered in and, and has done all kinds of things to bring pain and suffering, sickness and harm to us with great effect. And just as destructive, we discover there's evil within us. That we're made in the image of God, we are these broken people, these self-centered people who just d hurt each other, who are so destructive with one another. And when you just look back at, at what has happened in history and the systemic things that have gone on, all of the, the expressions of that, of how the strong have consistently abused and been cruel to the weak, systemic things where women have been mistreated, where children have been mistreated, where whoever the minority is has always been mistreated. We are so cruel to one another. There's evil from without. There's evil from within with the net effect that we are just killing ourselves. We're killing the most important relationships. We're just self-destructing. And this has been going on for thousands of years. And so in the first act, we see two things come into play that seem to be an attempt to set things right. Think back through the Old Testament narrative. In this first act, here are the two things that come into play to try and make this right. First of all, we're given a set of rules. The law is introduced. It's not just the Ten Commandments. The whole of the law revealing the character of God but the expectation of God for His people. And it lays out clear standards for how we should live. And you would hope that that would make us better, but it didn't. It didn't at all. In fact, this is what the New Testament informs us, is the law never made anyone better. The law simply revealed just how broken we are. And so a second thing comes into play, and that is in God's, the first act of God's narrative, he raises up some really charismatic, powerful individuals to try and get us back on course. And so you can fill in the blank of who it is for you know, any given generation, whether it's Abraham or Moses or David or Elijah or Elisha or Daniel or Samuel, or, you know, fill in the blank. And in generation after generation, when things seem like they've just gotten worse and how, they, how could they ever get any worse than what they are, and, and then God raises up a charismatic leader to try and pull people back toward God and back toward holy living and in the right direction. And for a little while, we seem to rise above the cesspool of what we have become collectively as a people and it gets better usually until that fella or that lady dies and then we go off the cliff again. That's the story of the Old Testament. In spite of God's perfect law and in spite of all of these wonderful charismatic leaders who look like they might be the hero that can pull us back on course, what we find is in the first act is that we are, we are so broken we seem to be broken without remedy and without hope. And it looks like evil is going to win and all is going to be lost until near the end of the first act, the true protagonist enters the story. His name is Jesus. He comes from next to nowhere, the most obscure of places, and he lives a life that no one notices essentially for 30 years. And at the end of the opening act... It looks like this one person who might finally be the only human being who could turn things around because he's different, he's supernatural. He is God in the flesh, and he looks like maybe he could be the one and only who could save the day, but right at the end of the opening act, it looks like even he couldn't do it. It looks like evil has defeated even him because he gets murdered. And you feel like, I mean, it's almost the end of the first movie. And it feels like, oh my goodness, this is a terrible story. All is going to be lost until three days later, the hero rises from the dead. 
And nobody's quite sure what to make of that other than this has got to be good. This is crazy. Nobody saw this coming. And here he is for 40 days walking around alive and demonstrating you can't keep me dead. I'm like no other. And, and now we're wondering what is going to happen next. And what happens next is unthinkable. He leaves. Nobody saw that as the end of the first movie. Nobody was, I mean, just like nobody saw his death coming, nobody saw his resurrection coming, nobody saw his ascension coming. I mean, that's the end of a movie that nobody's looking for. It's like, well, where's he going? And when's he coming back? End of Act One. That's an odd ending, wouldn't you agree? He's gone. He just showed up. He just got going good. He's gone. Let's jump to Act 3. I get that we won't all agree on the details of Act 3, but it's pretty easy to agree on the gist of Act 3. It's when Jesus comes back. Act 1 ended with his departure. Act 3 is going to begin with his return. Now, Act 3 can be summed up pretty simply. The conflict is going to be escalated to a level that's hard to imagine. It's hard to read about. It's why the book of Revelation is so difficult for us. And there are essentially two great conflicts and two wonderful windows of peace and harmony and the righteous rule of God. And, and if everybody's not going to agree, I don't care if you agree with what I'm about to say, but if you just read it in a straightforward fashion, it appears that the order of events as laid out in Revelation and other places is that during this final act, there's going to be one little window of time that's seven years long where all of the fury of the kingdom of darkness is unleashed on humanity and all of the wrath of God is unleashed on the forces of evil and the humans who have yielded to and cooperated with those forces of evil so that unspeakable, unimaginable things are going to happen in the span of those seven years. We call it the Great Tribulation. It's what chapters 6 through 18 of Revelation are all about. It's describing this incredible conflict, all the suffering and anguish that's going to happen in those seven years. We focus on that because it's a long part of the book, but the good news is it's only seven years. And following that, the great hero returns to live on earth for a span of what Revelation says is a thousand years. And he puts things in order as they truly should be. And there is finally peace on earth. There is real harmony. The scripture says the lion will lie down with the lamb. It's this picture of where among the, the animals of creation, among humanity, we finally live the way we were supposed to live in Eden in the first place for a thousand years. Now, whether that's exactly a thousand years or if that's figurative for just a really, really long time, Jesus is going to be back on planet earth and it's going to be good. It's going to be better than we could imagine. And then the unthinkable happens. I, I still can't, as much as I've studied it, I can't get my head around this. Somehow, in spite of that wonderful span of time, evil is going to rally one last time, and it will be the greatest conflict that the earth has ever seen. It's only going to last for a few months, and God is going to unleash everything he has got in that conflict. And all evil, all evil will be completely destroyed and put down at that final battle. And from that point on, it is just the righteous rule of God. It is the final judgment of God. It is the separation of all of humanity into two groups. And there's only one group you want to be a part of in that final judgment. Because it's going to be suffering from that point on for one group. And it's going to be joy and, and a participation in the family of God and the righteous rule of God. Ruling with God for all of eternity. And that is the conclusion of Act 3. Now, again... I know we, we may differ about the details of how that unfolds, but we can agree that is generally Act 3, right? You with me? We can agree on Acts 1 and Act 3. But here's the deal. We don't live in Act 1, and we don't live in Act 3 yet. We're living in Act 2 of this great drama. Act 2 is what has been known as the church age. It begins with the opening of the book of Acts, chapter 1. 
And it's going to conclude when Jesus comes back to earth. Now, here is what I would, the reason I, I'm taking all this time to set this up is because I believe that many Christians, and in my experience, it seems that the majority of Western Christians, I, I'm not trying to compare us, I just, I'm not sure what Christians in other worlds, in other parts of the world think, but Western Christians, in my experience, most of us seem to have a terrible misunderstanding as to the story that is being told in Acts 2 of God's great narrative, the part in which we live. You say, well, what's that misunderstanding? Well, well here's how I would sum it up. You know, one of the things that has become so popular in the last couple of decades in, in modern uh, pop culture and television is um, reality TV survival shows. Have you watched any of these? There's, there's a whole bunch of them out there. Um, I mean, you know, the show Survivor is sort of an example of it, but I'm not even talking so much about that as I am the, the ones that are truly where people are put in situations where it's difficult to survive. Bear Grylls has done one, or they've been, you know, like one of the edgiest ones is Naked and Afraid. You know, where the bottom line on all of these is it's essentially the same kind of deal where they take just a couple of people and they drop them into the most threatening, awful environments that we can imagine, some terrible jungle and some almost unexplored, unknown part of the world, and they're going to leave them there for a set amount of time. And the goal is basically simply this. With, without shelter, without food, without tools, without weapons, you just have to figure out how to survive in a world that is about to kill you. And if you've ever watched any of these shows, some of the places they take people to, you think, I think nature's going to win. I think they may die. It's just so bad. And what you're trying to do is just survive until you get to extraction day. Have you watched these shows enough to know what I'm talking about? There is a day that's set out there. It may be 21 days out or 40 days out or whatever, but there's always a set day, and sometimes you have to travel from point A to point B to get extracted. But what you are trying to do is just survive until you get to extraction day. Whew. You survived, and that's it. You, you won if you just lived to extraction day. I would contend that most Western Christians believe that Act 2 of God's narrative is some variation of that storyline. That we have been deposited in a terrible, cruel world. Jesus went back to the heaven and left us behind here to just try and survive in this awful world until extraction day comes. And that's really the main goal is just survive, just hang on and pray every day that today is going to be extraction day. I mean, you've heard people talk like that, haven't you? you you've seen how that changes our behavior, haven't you? Where when you think like that, what you try and do is just safeguard yourself. You try and create some shelter for yourself. You try and get in some kind of little community that's insulated from that terrible old world out there where they're going to hurt us. They're out to get us. And we've got to find some place to be safe and stay away from those bad people out there and just make it until we get to extraction day. And what I would say to you is that is not God's story. We've been misled. And it's screwing up our behavior. It's so radically impacting the way that we live because we believe that we're in a survival narrative and that isn't the story. God's narrative is a completely different story from that. See, that, that story has Jesus doing all of the work in Act 1 and in Act 2 and in between is this awful time that we live in that's just so sad. We wish we could have been there for Act 1 when Jesus was here. And we hope to live long enough to see Act 3 when Jesus comes back. But in the meantime, woe is me. So we live in this awful world. That is not the story Jesus is telling. That is not what God is doing. Jesus reveals a different story. Now, I understand why we get misled, why we get confused. In part... Because one of the major themes of the New Testament is suffering. Those who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. It's part of the deal. Jesus, in John 16, in the same talk that we're, we're about to look at in John 14, in that same talk, he said, hey, guys, I just want to be clear about this. The world has hated me, so you can count on it. They're going to hate you, too. So we understand that there's going to be suffering. There's going to be opposition. That is a part of the deal. But what Jesus said did not go the next logical step beyond that and say, so y'all just try and hang on, see if a few of you can make it to the end, and hopefully somebody's going to survive till extraction day. No! No! 
That is not the message of Jesus. What Jesus did in Act 1 was he kicked the door open. He, he made a way for the kingdom of God to begin to be ushered in here on earth. And for 2,000 years, he's been pouring out everything that is needed to bring heaven to earth. And when Act 3 rolls around, we're going to lose any illusion of the kingdom of heaven losing anything. Because it's going to be fully and completely ushered in. But between Act 1 and Act 3, every moment of every day, we're supposed to be bringing heaven to earth. And the beauty of what we saw in Act 1 that brought us some hope was when Jesus showed up. I don't just mean when he was born. I'm talking about when he was 30 and he stepped out of the shadows into the the spotlight. What did his life look like? What did his ministry look like? Well, it was just wonderful, wasn't it? Because think about, in general terms, what Jesus did. Jesus just, every day, he just strolled into the most normal, chaotic situations that that we could ever imagine. Things like our lives. And Jesus just strolled in, and he brought love and compassion. And for people who were hurting, or who were sick, or who were bleeding, or who were blind, or who couldn't walk. He brought relief. He brought healing to people who were oppressed and anxious. He brought deliverance. He gave people what they needed, what they longed for. What Jesus just did was he stepped into every situation of chaos and just made it right. It's crazy. I mean, in a world dominated by darkness, evil, and chaos, Jesus shows up at one little point in time, at one point on the globe, and everywhere that Jesus went, it was just like he stepped into a dark place and suddenly there's light. Whatever's broken starts getting put back together. Hearts get healed. Relationships get mended. People get right with God. People without hope or direction in life suddenly have joy and purpose and meaning because Jesus has arrived on the scene. And it's like, whew. Man, that is great. That is what's supposed to happen. But he only does it for three and a half years. That's what's so shocking. Only three and a half years. And then it's like, boop. He's done with that phase. Act one is over. And we tend to look back at that and go, that was great while it lasted, but it sure was short. I wish he'd come on back and finish this thing. And what we fail to catch is that Jesus was just beginning something that was going to take off to whole new levels through us all the way through Act 2. Are you with me? Sorry that took a while. Now we're going to get started. I'll be quicker with the, the outline having set the table. We're going to go to John 14. This is where we left off the last time I preached, which seems like about six months ago. It's the night that Jesus is betrayed. In less than 24 hours, he's going to be murdered. He is trying to... Jesus understands what's going on. He understands Act 1 is about to end. Things are about to change drastically. And he is trying to give his disciples a heads up to understand what life is about to be like in the second act. Because it's not going to look like the first one. And so in John 14, 12... Jesus gives these very important words of of instruction. He says, very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me. All right, don't run past that phrase. Who's he talking about? It's pretty, it's not very exclusive, is it? Whoever, I think I might even qualify for that. If just whoever believes in Jesus, we may all get in on that. Whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. And I'll do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I'll do it. Wow! That's pretty exciting. Verse 15, if you love me, keep my commands. You cannot skip that verse. It's a key qualifier in this whole deal. If you love me, keep my commands. And I'll ask the Father and he'll give you another advocate that, that one word right there, paraclete, in the Greek, gets translated more ways than probably any other single word in the Bible. It's the word for the Holy Spirit and what he does, what his job is. And so depending on which translation you're looking at, it may say comforter, it may say counselor, it may say advocate, helper, guide. He, he, he's all of the above and more. It, it means literally, the word means the one who comes alongside, wraps his arm around you, holds on to you, 
talks you up, coaches you up, pulls you along, gives you what you need. That's who's coming. I'll ask the Father and he'll give you another advocate, another helper to help you and to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him or knows him. Him, For he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore. But you will see me because I live. You also will live. And on that day, you will realize that I am in my Father and you are in me. And I am in you. Okay, we're just going to stop there. He's got a lot more good stuff to, to say here, but we're going to just jump ahead. Now, I'm going to invite you to flip four or five pages to the right to Acts 1. Remember, everything Jesus just said is on Thursday night of Passion Week. In less than 24 hours, he's going to be dead. Before the weekend is over, he's going to be raised from the dead. Now we're jumping a few weeks beyond that. Jesus is now alive. They've watched him die, completely dead and buried. They've seen him come back alive for 40 days. He's been demonstrating, oh, yeah, I am fully bodily raised to life. He eats with them, lets them touch him, hang out with him. In Acts 1-4, now the, remember, the book of Acts is what's raising the curtain on the second act of this drama. Luke, Dr. Luke, who wrote the third gospel narrative, he wrote a two-volume account. He covers Act 1 the conclusion of Act 1 and the opening of Acts 2. He tells about the life of Jesus when he was physically bodily on the earth, and then he talks about what Jesus did following that. So in Acts 1, beginning in verse 4, it says, On one occasion, while Jesus was eating with them, this is between the resurrection and his ascension, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift that my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. What gift is he talking about? Yeah, the paraclete, the advocate, the helper. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, you know that, that word baptism, it, it just gets one specific usage in our current language, right? I mean, we, we, we only baptize for one thing, and that is to formally announce that you were a part of the family of God. We're dunking you in the water. But the but word baptism literally just meant to immerse, to completely immerse in water. Well, he's saying, hey, John baptized people. He dunked people. He immersed them in the water. But I want to tell you, there is an immersion that's coming. It's going to be like nothing else. You are going to be immersed in this gift, the Holy Spirit. <laughs> okay, that was like the most wonderful announcement. And the disciples' response one more time is so discouraging. <laughs> Then they gathered around him. They're, they're excited because they, they get a sense that this is something big. So they gather around him and say, So, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Are you kidding me? Are we going back there again? What are they asking? So, so now are we finally going to rally the troops and kick those stinking Romans out of here so we finally get the power back that we want? Seriously, guys? Yep, that's what they're asking. And Jesus said to them, It's not for you to know the times or dates that the Father has set by his own authority. Which, by the way, Jesus is in, a, is in a vague way alluding to the fact that he is going to deal with the Roman Empire. But he's not going to do it the way that you expect. He's going to turn the Roman Empire into a Christian empire. He's not going to kill them. He's going to convert them. They're, they're gonna, the Roman Empire is going to try and kill all of you. And you don't overcome it by killing them or by running them out. You're going to love them in the middle of them killing other Christians. It's just a vague reference. You, you, don't, you aren't going to know the date or the time that it's going to happen. He'll deal with that. But let's focus on what's about to happen. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Oh, that's good. Going to get power. What's it going to be the power to do, Jesus? Is it going to be the power to whip those Romans? Is it going to be the power to take things over? Is it going to be the power to get control? No, you're going to receive power, and you will be my, what? You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea, even in Samaria. I know you hate them, but you're going to be witnesses there too, 
and to the ends of the earth. And after he said this, hang on. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes until a cloud hid him from their sight. And they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going. Don't you know they were? I mean, can't you imagine what they're thinking at that moment? What is he doing now? Where's he going and when's he coming back? They're just standing there wondering when suddenly two men dressed in white, obviously angels, they stood beside them and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way that you have seen him go into heaven. Now, what might have helped is if the angel had said, It's going to be a long time before he comes back. Because the disciples are looking at each other going, saying, do you think it's going to be before or after lunch? Do you think it's going to be before the Sabbath or on the Sabbath? I mean, what day do you think he's going to do? They have no sense. There's a whole other second act that's going to play out before he comes back. So they do what Jesus said do. They walk back across the Kidron Valley. They go into Jerusalem, and they go back to the room. Jesus said stay in Jerusalem and wait for the gift. And so they start praying and waiting, praying and waiting. And they do that for approximately 10 days. How do we know that? Well, because Pentecost is 50 days after Passover, and Jesus' ascension was 40 days after his resurrection. So approximately a week and a half after Jesus' ascension is where we pick things up in Acts 2, verse 1. They've been praying and waiting for a week and a half when the day of Pentecost came. They were all together in one place, and suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. I love that God does things the way that he does it. You know, the, whole, the promise has been that you're going to get this gift, and it is the Holy, we say Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit. Ghost is not a good translation. It's not really an effective translation. But the word means, pneuma really means breath. Wind, it's the wind of God, it is the breath of God. And so when he comes, what's the first thing they heard? It starts blowing, it starts blowing louder and louder. What's happening? God's breathing. God's breathing on his people. When they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them, and all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And so in that moment, on the day of Pentecost, began the great unfolding story of the drama that is Act 2. The Spirit of God now fills the people of God so that they live as Jesus all over the planet. And suddenly they're speaking in other tongues, not to be weird, but because it's Pentecost. And Jerusalem is filled with people from all these other lands around the Mediterranean, and they can't communicate with each other because they all speak different languages. And suddenly, with the Holy Ghost, they have supernatural power to speak languages that they've never studied, and they share the, the works of God in languages that they don't even know. And suddenly, they have the power of God to touch sick people, and they're made well. Deaf people can suddenly hear. Lame people can suddenly walk. And suddenly, these men who have been so shy and so uncertain are so bold that they'll stand even while the people who murdered Jesus are watching and gritting their teeth and they'll stand in front of them and preach Jesus to the crowd that's what the coming of the Holy Spirit has done for them in a moment of time so begins act two so we conclude what now has been a 20 part series on getting to know Jesus and it may seem like Maybe an odd place to land, but it's, to me it's the perfect and an important place for us to land because the whole deal of the last 19 weeks where we've been marching through Matthew's gospel account, and I know we, we deviated for this final one. We had to go beyond Matthew for this. It's just this. We spent 19 weeks focusing singularly on Jesus in the three and a half years when he was physically just a human on earth and just trying to get to know the person of Jesus, what he was like, learning everything we can from him and about him, just getting to know Jesus. But I realized as I was preparing this series, 
it's not appropriate for us to end on getting to know Jesus with just the Jesus we discover in Act 1 because we don't live in Act 1. We live in Act 2. And there's a really big difference. I mean, we, we read about Act 1 and we go, oh, it would have been so nice. I wish I could have been there. So when I've got all these problems and questions, I could just go up to Jesus and put my arm around him and say, hey, man, can I talk to you? Can I ask you some questions so you can give me some direction and help me out here? We don't live in that time. We live in a different time. We live in a time that Jesus said would be much better than that time. Why is this much better than that time? Because in that time, you had to go to where Jesus was. You had to go to Bethany or Jerusalem or, or Capernaum to wherever he was and get his attention where there's a whole crowd trying to get his attention. And a lot of people went away disappointed because one person can only touch so many people. If we're going to really get to know Jesus, we've got to know more than just the Jesus who showed up and took on human form for a short span of time. We need to get to know the Jesus who is here now, and he's not in one physical body. It's Jesus in me. It's Jesus in you that we need to discover in Act 2. Paul said in Colossians 1, which Colossians 1 is my favorite, one of my favorite chapters in all of the New Testament because he just brags on Jesus. But near the conclusion of that chapter, he says this, And the mystery is that Christ lives in you, and he is your hope of sharing in God's glory. You know, if we did a little question and answer thing today, and I said, Okay, so tell me, where is Jesus today? If you're like me, the... First answer that's on the tip of your tongue is going to be, well, I imagine he's in heaven, at the, seated at the right hand of God the Father. And that would be a good answer, by the way. I mean, we, if we're being real specific, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. But Paul said, here's the mystery. Even though that's true, Christ is also in you. And I know those of us who are real concrete thinkers are going, wait a minute, wait a minute. That is not what Jesus said. Jesus said... I'm going to go back to, in John 14, I'm going to go back to the Father. I'll ask the Father, and he will send you, the third person in the Trinity, he will send you the Spirit. So it's the Holy Spirit in me. Jesus is the right hand of the Father, and the Holy Spirit is who is in me. And the New Testament reveals this is part of the mystery, is to have the Spirit in you, is to have Jesus living in you, because it is the Spirit of Christ who has come to live in us. So, all right, diving into that. If you'll follow along in your outlines, there are four things as we're concluding this idea of getting to know Jesus, four things that I want to share with you. And the first is this, that Jesus expects to do more through us than he did while he was on the earth. Wow. Okay, follow along with me. Everybody got, got your Bibles open or your outline out? Because I want you to look again for a moment at these verses in John 14. Follow along with me as I read. Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Whoever believes in me will do the same things that I do. I want everybody to say the same things. In fact, I want you to look at your neighbor and just tell them Jesus wants to do the same things through you that he did. Find somebody and tell them. Okay, that's pretty good, isn't it? That's pretty exciting. Let's take it a step further. Next, he says... Those who believe will do even greater things. Everybody say, even greater things. even greater things. They will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. All right, find that neighbor again. Now tell them Jesus wants to do greater things through you than he did himself. How's that for good news? Whoa! Whoa! And if you ask for anything in my name, I'll do it for you so that the Father's glory will be shown through the Son. If you ask me for anything in my name, I will do it. Okay, did everybody get what he just said? The stuff that you've seen me do, if you believe in me, you're going to do it. In fact, it doesn't end there. You're going to do far greater things than what I've done. Let's flesh this out a little bit. When you think back to the life of Jesus, this is audience participation time, what are some of the things that you would say were pretty cool that Jesus did, that were Jesus things? Okay, raise the dead is pretty high on the list. What are some other Jesus things? Healed lame people. Made wine out of water. That's pretty cool. All right. He walked on water. What else? 
He healed blind people. He cast demons out of people. Y'all are on a roll. Keep going. Calm the storm. Wow. What else? He forgave sins. Wow. Hey, here's another cool one. He multiplied food. I like that one a lot. He died for our sins. Here's another one that's pretty neat. He made crazy people sane. Remember the demoniacs on the shores of Gadara? Naked and crazy. He made crazy people say, I mean, Jesus just did all of this stuff. And now he just told us and the disciples, I say us because he said, whoever believes in me. He's not just saying whoever in this room. He's saying whoever in the world believes in me will do what I've been doing. Wow, that's big stuff. They will do even greater than me. Okay, now here's where it's going to get a little bit trickier. Still audience participation time. How many of you believe that that applies, truly applies to you, that Jesus wants to do what he did while he was on earth and even greater things through you in this life? I, all right, I'm, I'm putting you on the spot. I want to see your hands. How many of you believe that Jesus wants to do it through you? All right, about half or two-thirds. We're getting there. We're getting there. Now one more question. How many of you would say, I'm trying to think how to say this nicely or gently. I'll just say it bluntly. By a show of hands, how many of you would say, I feel like pretty much so far in my life, that hadn't been happening. That, I haven't really measured up to that. Ooh, I think we got 100% on that one. Okay, I, I don't even think we have to go down this road. It's not a shortcoming on Jesus' part. Jesus is not yanking us around. He is not playing games. He wants to do far more. He plans to do far more through us than he even did when he was on earth. And universally we're saying, I don't think that's happening yet. All right, great. How do we get from where we have been to walking in that kind of power? I mean, here's what Jesus is saying. The thing that we just said about Jesus, that wherever Jesus went, he just strolls into chaos, pain and suffering, and he just brings help and hope and joy and deliverance and relief, right? That's what Jesus does. And Jesus is just saying, this is how it's going to get so much better. Suddenly, every one of you is going to have everything that I had, so wherever you go, you get to do the same thing. How do I get from the life that I have been living to being that man or that woman? That wherever I go, it just brings life it brings healing, it brings hope, it brings forgiveness, it brings deliverance and all of that stuff. How do I get to that? All right, that's what Jesus is spelling out for us. Second point, Jesus' plan for making us powerful and bold is through one thing. It's through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is it. Jesus said, don't you leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift that he promised. Because you're going to be in a world of hurt if you don't wait for that, if you don't get that. And he says, you remember John baptized with water. That was a good thing. But in just a few days, you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And when that happens, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you'll be my witnesses and you'll tell people about me everywhere. And you're going to do a lot more than that. You can do the same things that I did and more. No, I'm just being candid. I'm not, I'm not criticizing anybody or anything. I'm just being candid about my story. I've been in church all my life. been in church since nine months before I was born. Never been a season that I hadn't been in the church. Love Jesus. Love his word. Love his work. I spent a lot of my life trying to build and defend a theology that would protect and explain my experience and what was lacking in my experience. Trying to explain away why it was okay to not have walked in and lived out and experienced some things. You see, I grew up in, a, in an expression of the church that's really strong in some areas but is really, really fearful of some of the things that can accompany what we're talking about today. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit. And, and let me say in defense of, of people who come from that kind of background, part of the reason that there's so much fear and, and hesitancy 
is because they've seen the excesses and kind of the craziness that can go with, with other expressions that welcome the work of the Holy Spirit, but then try and do some things that really don't line up with the Scriptures. And so you, you get where people can get gun shy. So I grew up in expressions of the church where you started talking about or just even using the phrase, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and we're quietly going, eh, eh, know what you are. <laughs> don't want any of it. You're going to try and lay your hands on me and make me speak in tongues and have me taking laps around the church during worship. I mean, I don't want any part of that. So we, we ran from that. Actually, what we did was we sat very quietly on our hands and tried to pretend like that wasn't real go away. And yet, deep down inside, there was a part of me that hoped I was wrong. That hoped there was more. That heard other people describing their experiences with the Holy Spirit and thought, oh, I would give anything to experience that. But I haven't, so I better build a theology around my experience. And like a lot of other people who were my friends, we did. And I could explain that at length, and I'm not going to, because it's got some major holes in it. At the end of the day, the bottom line is, <laughs> there are things that need to happen with us and the Holy Spirit that don't fit into the theology that I came up in. You know, there are some commercials that we, we've all seen thousands of commercials in our lifetimes, or at least my generation and older have. Thankfully, the younger generation gets to skip those. But, you know, we, there are certain commercials you'll remember for the rest of your life, aren't there? How many of you remember the, the Nest Tea commercials? Take the Nest Tea plunge. How many of you remember that commercial? If you're old enough, everybody remembers that. No matter who was doing that sp particular commercial, they all did the same thing in the end. Do you remember? You know, you drink nest tea, and what do they do next? They're always standing next to a pool, and that's it. They stretch out their arms, and then they just fall backwards, and they're immersed in the pool. Take the nest tea plunge. To me, that commercial becomes a perfect picture of, of sort of an experience in my life. When we think about the Holy Spirit... The thing that I would always say before in the earlier part of my life was, I know what the Word says about the Holy Spirit. And, and I was right about this part. The Word says, if you belong to Jesus, if you've trusted Jesus, you've got the Holy Spirit. Paul said in Ephesians and in other places that this is God's way of sealing you. It's His way of guaranteeing that you're saved. He gives you His Holy Spirit. He says in Romans 8 that if you haven't received the Holy Spirit, that you don't belong to God. So there you got it. I got the Holy Spirit. He gave it to me. Inside of me, like drinking that glass of tea. I got it on the inside. And in that sense, it's true. Got him. Got the Holy Spirit on the day that I got saved. But here's the thing. There's an experience of being given the deposit, and there's the experience of being immersed. You know, in part of the commercial, they're just taking a sip of something cold and wet, and then there's another part in the commercial where they just let go and they just fall back and get immersed in something that's cool and wet. Now, essentially, what I had spent much of my life doing theologically was saying, you know, if someone would, would essentially, in spiritual terms, ask, have you ever been in the Gulf on a day when the waves are really breaking and just gotten out in the water and felt the power of the waves? And in response, I was essentially saying the equivalent of, well, more or less I have. I mean, I've drank bottled water. Wait a minute. That was not the question. The question is, have you ever gotten in the gulf and, and felt the power of the waves? Have you ever body surfed? Have you ever experienced that? I mean, pretty much. I, I have a Dasani every day. I mean, it's, it's water, and it, I get it inside of me. And I, So, yeah, I mean, pretty much I've done no, no. Yes, they're both water, but they are not the same thing. One of them is getting a little of it in you. The other one is getting immersed in it. Let me just say, one of my all-time favorite things ever in my life since I was a little kid is I love to body surf. It is so much fun to get out there when the waves are huge. I mean, honestly, the flags have got to be red for it to be good. But on those days, I know I've got a little daredevil in me, but on those days, I love to get out there right where the waves are really cresting, and you know what it's like if you body surf. 
man, when you catch the right wave, you're waiting for one that's big enough, and you, you go with it, and you dig, dig, dig right to begin with. And if you caught it, if you timed it just right, there is that moment where you realize, I can quit paddling because for just a split second, it's like the wave pulls you back up into it, and you know in that moment, oh, it's got me. It's, I'm not going to have to do anything else, and chances are it's going to take me, without paddling another stroke, it's going to take me all the way in until I'm laying on my belly on the sand from this one wave because the power of the wave has now taken me. Friends, that is a picture of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I spent a lot of my life having a cool sip of Nesti or Dasani plenty of times in my life, but so scared to actually go in the water and be pulled into the power of the wave. I mean, and here is the scary thing. If you've body surfed on really rough days, is when the wave gets you, when it pulls you in, you aren't in control anymore. As I mean, I've had plenty. If you've done it much, you've done what I've done. I mean, there are moments when you don't, for whatever reason, you don't get to ride the wave the fun way that you thought you would, and it just plants your face in the sand, and you get you know, all scuffed up and torn up, and it rolls you up, and you're like, wow, that wasn't fun at all. And then you go back out and catch, try to catch another wave because you're not in control. The wave is in control. And that's the, that's the little bit of a scary thing on a red flag day about riding the waves. I know somebody's going to write me and tell me, you just encourage people to go out on red flags. We'll say yellow flag, okay, just to feel better. But on those days, that's the scary thing is you won't always be in control, and that's what scares us about being immersed in the work of the Holy Spirit is we are yielding ourselves to someone who's in control and it's giving him control and it's such a good thing and part of what's a little frustrating and perplexing about it is you can't even control receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit and that, that's part of what's a little broken about some of the people who come from a different camp who are talking about nothing but the work of the Holy Spirit who act like they've got a faucet that they can turn on and off at will and give you what they've got and make it be manifest the way that they tell you it'll be manifest as if it's, no, the Spirit of God gets to determine when He's going to envelop you, but it's not going to be completely his doing you got to cooperate with it you got to be willing to wade out in the water and and paddle with the wave and and be receptive to it but you don't completely control it now some of you may be may have come from a background like me and you may be going i'm not sure whether this that sounds like a great analogy that sounds like a nice story but i'm not sure it lines up with the scripture let me give you the scriptural a scriptural piece that in my old days, I could never explain away, and I'm at the point now I don't need to explain it away because I realize it just is what it is. In Acts 2, on the day of Pentecost, the disciples were baptized in the Holy Spirit, and they were radically changed as a result of it. But here's the trick question. When did the disciples receive the Holy Spirit? It wasn't on the day of Pentecost. The thing that we ran past in the Baptist church about Jesus' resurrection, go back and look at the end of John. John tells us a lot about the day that Jesus rose from the dead. Part of what he tells us about the day that Jesus rose on that Sunday is that you know, through, through the day, the men didn't see Jesus. When we get to the end of Resurrection Sunday, the men are still hiding in the dark. They are literally behind locked doors, quaking in their boots, scared to death that the People who killed Jesus are going to come looking for them. And Jesus just shows up and is with them. And he has this exchange with them. And one of the first things that Jesus does, you remember what he says? It says, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, what in the world is going on there? I mean, I used to read that as a good Baptist kid and be like, what's up, Jesus? I mean, because we know they don't get it till Acts 2. They're not going to get it for another seven weeks. Are you just playing games with them? Are you toying with them? No, he wasn't playing games with them. Why would Jesus say receive the Holy Spirit if he wasn't giving it to them in that moment? He gave them a big swig of nest tea right there. He breathed on them. Received the Holy Spirit. Guess what happened? 
the crucifixion and resurrection have happened for the first time ever in human history. The gospel story exists and by placing your faith in Jesus, which now for the first time they believe because they've just now seen the resurrected Jesus, for the first time they believe the gospel. The gospel didn't exist before then. We didn't have the news yet. It's still brand new. And in the moment that that happens, what happens when you believe? You get the Holy Spirit. Jesus breathed on them and they got the Holy Spirit, the deposit. So what in the world happened seven days later? They got baptized into they took the full plunge. What did life look like for those seven weeks in between? We aren't given a ton of details, but if you read everything that the Bible says about those intervening weeks, it's a bit of a roller coaster ride. The disciples are up and down. Some believe, some don't believe. Sometimes they believe, sometimes they doubt. They're going back to their old way of life. They're just, they're kind of all over the place. But you know what they're not doing? They're not healing the sick. They're not casting out demons, and they're not boldly preaching. They are living in obscurity. They look a lot like 21st century American Christians. But on the day of Pentecost... These men who believed in Jesus, who had received the Holy Spirit, who were trying to believe what they were hearing and seeing, had the power of the Holy Spirit immerse them. And in a moment of time, they were filled with boldness. They were filled with power. They were filled with gifts, enablings that they never had before. Suddenly, they're speaking all these languages that they didn't know. They are transformed men. And suddenly... Peter, who's been hiding out with everyone else, is standing before thousands and saying, This Jesus whom you crucified, I'm sure he's eyeballing the biggest Pharisees in the room, saying, Uh huh, you and you and you voted to have him put to death. That same Jesus that you crucified, God has declared to be Lord and King when he raised him from the dead. That is boldness. When the very people who murdered your friend are in the crowd and you're pointing your finger at them and saying, Jesus is Lord and you can't shut me up. He didn't just suddenly find some courage. He got immersed in the Holy Spirit. Friends, that same spirit still has the same transforming effect on us. How do we get from where we've been to where he wants us to be, where the works that he's done are done through us, ain't but one thing going to get us there. It's not a class. It's not a service. It's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Two more things that I'll say quickly and we're done. To be filled with the Holy Spirit is to be filled with Jesus. Just to be clear, Jesus said, you know, if you love me, you'll do what I command, and I'll ask the Father, he'll give you another helper. He's the Spirit of truth. He lives in you and will be in you. And he goes on to say, you, you will be in me and you'll know that I am in you. It is Jesus and everything that Jesus stands for that when we're immersed in the Holy Spirit that's going to come out through us. And the thing that's so important is to understand to be filled with the Holy Spirit doesn't turn us into these holy, rolling, mean-spirited, loudmouth Christians that we see around us a lot and that make their way onto TV a whole lot. We just look more like Jesus when we're filled with the Holy Spirit. And what was Jesus like? Well, he wasn't like a lot of Christians that I hear speaking so loudly today. We're, we're, we, do you not get the feeling a lot of times that people have somehow equated being a committed Christian or a spirit-filled Christian with needing to rail against whatever particular sin you hate the most? Or whatever particular group you hate the most. So like we're going to rail against the Republicans or rail against the Democrats or rail against this leader or that leader. We're going to rail against divorce or rail against abortion or we're going to you know, rail against whatever the transgenderism or homosexuality or whatever. And it's not about, I'm not saying anything to try and defend anything. I'm just saying you're going to look more like Jesus who, by the way, I don't hear railing against anybody. The accusation against Jesus is what's wrong with this guy because he's the friend of all these people. He's the friend of these people whose lives are just so tangled up in sin, and he loves hanging out with them. And he doesn't make them get fixed before they can hang out with him. In fact, the only people we find Jesus railing against is the religious crowd who were judgmental and railing against people. <laughs> Hello. And when we get filled with the Holy Spirit, what we're getting filled with is Jesus 
And so what we're going to look like is the same Jesus who looked at chaotic lives and broken, messy people and said, I'd love to be your friend. I'd love to do dinner with you. I would love to hang out with you. I'd love to get to know you. And you don't have to fix it all before I'd spend time with you. And He brought help and healing and hope into dark places and broken lives. And so to become filled with the Holy Spirit doesn't make us more cruel or more judgmental. It makes us really far, far more loving. In the same talk as John 14, one chapter earlier in the same talk, Jesus said, A new command I give you, love one another. As I've loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples, if you love one another. Paul said in Galatians 5 about the the work of the Spirit in us. He says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. You know, the people that are always railing against this and railing against that and, you know, preaching down to. You know what I don't hear in any of that? Is any peace or any joy or any love. That's not the fruit of the Spirit. Spirit's always giving us more love for people, a greater sense of peace, a greater sense of joy. I mean, in my personal experience with the Holy Spirit, the, the things that are the most obvious evidence in my life of those encounters is just so much joy, so much peace, so much more love for people. I've been transparent about this before. I'll say it again today. I grew up religious, and I grew up as a follower of Jesus with strongholds in my life. And the two biggest strongholds that I can think of were racism and being a judgmental Pharisee. I was good at both. I was so good at the racism thing, you would have never guessed that I was a racist. I was a good Baptist boy of the South, so you didn't talk bad about people of other races. You just judged them quietly in your heart and just smiled and talked nicely while holding a rotten attitude. And I'll tell you what was just as toxic was as a good religious kid I judged everybody who was guilty of a sin that I hadn't committed yet. If you were divorced or you drank or you smoked or you cussed or you this or you that, you had sex before marriage, I judged the daylights out of you and I didn't want to do, have anything to do with you. Now I wouldn't say it out loud. I just judged you in my heart and hated you quietly. And you know what I discovered the longer that I lived and the hungrier I became for Jesus and his work and the work of his spirit in my life? Is that there is not room in one human heart for both racism and the Holy Spirit. There is not room in one human heart for both a judgmental spirit and the Holy Spirit. And it took time, but over time, God created a hunger in me for Him, for the work of His Spirit, to the point that I wanted that far more than I wanted to hold on to the ability to judge other people or hate other people. And what I discovered is, as I embraced the work of the Holy Spirit, that judgment and that racism just began to evaporate and be replaced with a deep love for people, a deep hunger to connect with people and, and realizing that I'm no different than the people that I've judged and that I've disliked. The work of the Spirit is to make us more like Jesus because it is the Spirit of Jesus. The fourth and final thing we'll say is this, is Jesus wants us to be both baptized into and continually filled with his spirit. It's interesting to me that on that day when Peter stood up and preached at the end of his message, the people were cut to the quick and they said, what should we do then? And Peter said, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized. He's talking about water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this promise is to you, your children, and to those far away, all who have been called by the Lord our God. Now that's the opening piece. <coughs> Repent, turn, believe, and be baptized, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's interesting that he ties all those things together, and I find it ironic that we will be hungry for an experience with God and want to skip the things that he's told us to do. You remember what Jesus said in John 14? You obey the things that I command, and I'll, I'll send you my spirit, and I'll answer your prayers. I'll do what you ask. But there was a big qualifier. And Peter says, you want the Holy Spirit? 
Believe and be baptized. And it's, I just almost want to laugh out loud when people are like, I want to be a follower of Jesus. All right, the first thing you need to do now is to be baptized. Well, now about that, I don't, I'm not a big fan of the water. I don't really, mm, baptism. I just want to be a Christian. Okay, great. Believe and be baptized and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Isn't it weird that we expect spiritual baptism without having to follow through on having water baptism? Okay, I'm not going to chase that rabbit any further, but it's just, it is an interesting observation. C.S. Lewis, who I think is one of the most brilliant minds in Christianity, at least in the last century or two, in uh, Mere Christianity, I was reading a, a piece the other day where he was saying how the way that God does things is just, it's almost never the way that we expect. Isn't that the truth? I mean, he says, consider this, for instance, in nature. He's like, if you had to just, if, without knowing anything about humans, if, if you said, okay, how do you make a new human? How, how would you make a human? How would you make a human in someone? He's like, you would never dream up sex as the answer to that. He's like, when you think about, you know, this plus that equals a new human being in you, he's like, That's, how did God think that up? God does things in strange ways. And he said, just like how God makes a human in a person through the strangest of ways, he said, God putting recreating Christ in us, that he chooses the most unusual means to do that. I want to read just a line from Mere Christianity that Lewis said. He said, there are three things that spread the life of Christ to us, that essentially you know, recreate Christ in us. Baptism, belief, and holy communion. At least those are the three ordinary methods. I don't have time to unpack that. I'm just going to let you chew on that. Belief, huge. We, we preach that one all the time where I grew up. But belief, baptism, and communion are the three really tangible means that God uses to recreate Christ in us. So let's not skip the things that we know to do. God wants us to be baptized into the work of Christ and the Holy Spirit. And he wants us to be daily filled with the Spirit. In Ephesians 5.18, Paul said, don't be drunk with wine. That'll ruin your life. Don't, don't yield your life to the control of alcoholic spirits. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. That word there literally is to be continually being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not just something that's going to happen just once in your life in a worship service. Every day, yield yourself to the control of the Holy Spirit. One final verse that I'll share with you. Jesus in Luke 11.13 said this, Even though... You are bad. You know how to give good gifts to your children. So how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Don't you love the simplicity of that? He's saying, look, you know, as parents, you're broken people. you got jacked up motives, and yet you love to give good things to your children. So when you, as the children of God, ask your Father to, to pour out the Spirit on you, don't you know He is just itching to do that? Don't you know He'll answer that? And that's where we land today. Do you long for more in your experience with God? Do you long to go from, from this experience to the plunge? I, I'm not here to sell you a bill of goods. I'm just here to say that for some of us who've played it safe on the banks, on the edge of the pool, it's time to plunge into the pool. It is time to be immersed in the work and the person of the Holy Spirit. If that's what you long for today, I want to encourage you, begin to press into that. Seek after that. Yield yourself to that. Hey, if that's your desire today, you may want to just invite some people. That we'll have leaders at the front and back who'd love to pray with you to experience that, not just in this moment of time, but in an ongoing way in your life. Would you join me as we go to him together in prayer right now? Oh, God. Thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you, Father, for the gift of your Son and all that he has brought us. And we thank you so much for the sweet gift of your Spirit. Lord Jesus, thank you for your Spirit that lives in us, that teaches us, that reminds us of you and of what you taught, who instructs us every day, who empowers us for life. And Spirit of Christ, we welcome you. We welcome your work. We invite you to come. Come and do a fresh work today. We don't want to sip. We want to be immersed in you and in your work. Would you come today? Would you baptize us into your work? Just as on that first day of Pentecost, 
You changed people's lives forever by your work. We're never going to work our way into what you want to make of us. We need you, Spirit of Christ. Come and do a fresh work among us today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to take a little. Thanks so much for tuning in today. I surely hope that what you heard was relevant and helpful and above everything. I hope that what you experienced today really helped your heart to connect with the heart of God. Now, if what you heard uh, for you stirred up any questions or maybe led you toward uh, some type of spiritual decision, maybe you want to talk with someone about something that's on your mind, I would love to hear from you. And so I would encourage you, reach out by email. At the bottom of the screen, you see my email address. It's mark at myfreedomchurch.net. That's not going to go to a secretary or an assistant. That will come directly to me. I'd love to hear from you and talk with you about anything that's on your mind. And if in the future you're in our area, we would love for you to come and worship with us at Freedom Church. But until then, we invite you to access all of the sermon material that you find online. Again, thanks so much for taking the time to join us today. Hope that you have a great day.